Hello and welcome to another episode of Creative Excellence. I am your host, Davina Lee, and we are coming to you from the studios of the Government Information Service. On this show, we discuss the artist landscape in St. Lucia. We discuss the work, the balance, and the aspirations. My guest today, he really needs no introduction. He is a producer, a singer, songwriter, a father. I would like to welcome to Creative Excellence, Mr. Shane Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Shane. How are you doing? I'm good, Davina. Thank you very much for, for having me. It's, it's indeed a pleasure. I mean, I really appreciate you having me. Okay. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you is a question I ask everybody who comes on this show. And it is, what do you call yourself? Like in the intro, I said you're a father. You're a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that you also read your personality. What do you call yourself when says, somebody says, Shane, what are you? I am purposefully, purposefully curious. I, I, I think that's, that would encompass what I consider myself to be, because I'm always driven towards endeavors that, um, that are challenging, but endeavors that have you know, some sort of expression towards them. So I mean, I've done, like you mentioned, the, the singing, the songwriting, um, producing music, radio, television as well, mm -hmm. and um, even a little bit of acting here or there. Okay? <laughs> but um, it's for me, it's, it's always about something that just allows you to just free up, if you will, like just on a level. I, 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 it's it's difficult. I'm, I'm always curious, and I'm always seeking to find purpose in expression. Mm -hmm. So when I see, so what is it? Purposefully curious. Uh, purposefully, yeah, purposefully Shane, curious. I don't know. I don't know. Curious. No, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a creator. I'm a creator. Let's okay. go. I'm a curious creator. Curiosity okay. is a big like part of it. I like that one. Curious creator. creator. Yeah. Now you didn't start off as Shane Ross, the R&B crooner <laughs> that we all know. What was no. the journey to get there? Because I know the story. Can you tell us what is the story? How did you start in the? entertainment i should say what was your thing well my very first foray into into music um in terms of a, a into in a public sphere oh. was at the monorepo combined school um i did um a calypso uh that was that was a long time ago let's not try mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I i wrote and performed the calypso at the first and incidentally the only calypso competition ever at that school there were three competitors and I tied for second, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Calypso. Um, okay. Calypso was my, my first for I'd always remember like writing songs growing up, just making up songs, you know, banging on the, the old uh, milk tins and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. we used to, I used to do a lot of that. And I always used to come up with little catchy little things, sometimes make up songs from existing dance hall and stuff like that. But my first foray into the public sphere as a performer was at that that primary school in that Calypso competition. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my song, I mean, I was the only one who wrote the, his own right. song and stuff like that. And I always tell myself, listen, if I wrote my own song and the other two had the songs professionally written for them, when I right. say professionally written, yes, I mean, somebody else somebody who yes. was, not just who wrote it, but somebody who had actually penned songs okay, for, you know, for, for, for money, who, right. who, who did that essentially professionally. Okay. And um, I was like, hey, I was able to tie for second place. Yeah, so that's good. But I, I, I don't tell myself beyond that that there were yes. more than three. Uh, there right. were no more than three. <laughs> <laughs> so like, and, you know. Right, right, right. But for me, that, that was my, my first jump into it. Mm. And I think from there, it's just like, like there's... But didn't you do like, wouldn't you like rapping before you were singing? I no, that, that's no, that, was that was in primary school. That was in oh, primary, so primary school. school. Yeah, so, so that's my after. first jump into yes, that. Yes, okay. Then from there, like what I, what I found myself doing, I mean, I'd always had a love for music and mm -hmm. creating songs and stuff like that. And then there was the, the Guinness Freestyle Competition. Oh, okay. And that, that one was the one that, um, you know, that, that put, I mean, that put mm -hmm. butterflies in my, in my stomach. And mm -hmm. like, I remember this feeling of extreme nervousness where it's like, it's almost like this, this, this fear of the stage and fear of mm -hmm. like, you know, and, um, that that's something looking back it's something i think i always got like a bit of a high off of it as a as a, as a young person mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still mm -hmm. relatively young I yeah <laughs> okay but like you know you 
it's just this thing that you feel like you have to overcome and you have to break through. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, I would always find myself in positions where, you know, like I have to either have to go perform somewhere or go do something that, you know, it's like, whoa, you're going to do that. That's mm -hmm. you're in front of a camera, right. in front of people. And people tell me, like, how do you do it? I'm like, well, I really don't know. It's just it's just something I have to overcome. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, though, like I've noticed that it's like, for example, I would come from work sometimes and there would be a karaoke. And like, I would be fighting myself, don't, don't go, don't sing, don't sing, don't sing. But I would still every now and again just jump up mm -hmm. on the mic. But to, to answer your question, how did I get to that whole crooner thing? From that Guinness freestyle competition, I was, um, I think I was, a, I was a finalist, a national finalist. And from there, um, Christopher Hunt, I can't remember how, when I was at the competition itself, but he approached me shortly after. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yo, you, you have, you know, you can rap and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And it's like, I'd like to work with you. And he introduced me to Libo. Mm -hmm. And from there, like, you know, we started working on Naked, which was mm -hmm. the Naked one. <laughs> yes. And I remember Naked started off as a song that, um, it was just a rap song straight mm -hmm. through with just a little R&B chorus. So then um, when they, they first heard the song, they're like, yeah, the rapping is nice, you know, but as if we want more of the R&B in this. So right. Like, okay, more R&B. I'm like, so, but it's the, the whole chorus is in R&B, so what you're talking about? Like, yeah. you know what, give us a verse. I'm like, okay, I will do one R&B verse. So then after we did the one R&B verse and two rap verses, they're like, hmm. Give us another R&B verse. Us another <laughs> R &B verse. So I'm like, but if we do that, then it's not going to be a radio song anymore. It's going to be gonna be too long. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to, and they're like, well, um, how about we just drop one of the rap verses? Right. I'm like, so that means I'll, I'll have two R and B in two R and B verses and just one rap verse. I'm like, but I'm not a singer. I'm a, I'm a rapper. Yes. And they're like, no, but it's it's you can keep your one verse. I'm like, <laughs> how generous. Yeah. And I'm like, and then I was like, you know what? Why not? Mm -hmm. But there, yeah, let's just go with it. And when that song, I remember when that song first played, uh, the date played on the radio, I wasn't even aware of what was really going on, but my phone was just going crazy. Like, the, um, Iowa was calling me, mm. a bunch of other radio stations were calling me, like, who's this? your clothes i want you i can't fake it you already know over to my bed baby even on the floor anyhow you like it i'm ready to go i want to get you naked girl take off your clothes i want you i can't fake it you already know over to my bed baby even on the floor anyhow you like it i'm ready to go come a little bit so baby, don't turn off the lights I'm gonna do it to you just the way you like It doesn't matter, we can do this all night I'm not gonna hurt you, gonna do your body right okay. From there, everything just like... Now, okay, now you mentioned Christopher and you mentioned Libo The first time I knew anything about you was through Tempest Now Tempest, well, I guess, was a production that was put on by mm -hmm. Chris and, and Libo that really brought together, I mean, a lot of talent in St. Lucia that I had never heard before. We had Level 4, mm -hmm. yourself, I mean, Lisa Weeks. There was like a bunch of people, and it yeah. felt like this certain renaissance in, in, in music. Um, what was like that for you, um, being part of, of Tempest? That was just like a very, uh, that was like an amazing time in St. Michel for it music. It absolutely was. Let me tell you, the excitement that, um, and mind you, this was, I was still riding high off of the wave of, of Naked. So right. it was like, in, a lot of people were like, yo, we're coming to see who sings that song, you know, mm. that particular song. And, and I mean, that's not taking away anything yes. from any of the other performers at Tempest. But I remember, like, when we, because we were racing at Gaty, I think it was. Mm. And when we were there, like, you know, Libo, Libo has long been known as, in terms of quality and, and just production, like Libo was, Libo was it. I mean, you work mm -hmm. with Libo and you yes, know for a fact like that top. you work with the mm -hmm. best, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and most of the productions came from Libo. Mm -hmm. So you, you have an idea as to the quality of music that was, and, and Libo was somebody, I mean, Libo has probably up, up 
if you get the whole of his catalog and probably archives, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. archives of music, a lot of stuff mm -hmm. probably you've never heard or yes. probably unreleased or what have you. But um, the quality of music was it was good, and not just it, it being good, but it was we knew great. it was it yeah. Was we good. we we also knew that none of us were trying to do what was normal mm -hmm. in society at the because time. Because I'm going to cut you off. Mm -hmm. At the time for St. Lucia music, Ricky T was actually very riding high. That yes. was like 2005, yeah. 2006 high. That was Ricky T's time. Yeah. And we were always known as having Calypso and Soka. And Soka, yeah. So we didn't expect to, I didn't expect to hear reggae, dancehall, R&B <laughs> coming out of St. Lucia yeah. and of such a high standard. Yeah. I mean, there, there were, in terms of the reggae and the dancehall, they had, mm -hmm. they, there's always been reggae and dancehall, yes, but not but to the extent like of, that. Mm -hmm. of Soka and, mm -hmm, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Calypso. Um, but with, with that, it's like, it, it just showed that there were a lot of people who had a, a palette for something that was other than soca. Mm -hmm. And like when you hear about the St. Lucian <clears throat> performer at the time, like nobody was thinking, well, boy, there, there are people who do R&B, especially like outside of stuff like hotels and cover bands. Mm -hmm. So getting that, you'd be like, yo, this is actually interesting that this might be something for me. So the, just the cross section of, of, of artists and everybody was young and excited and everybody was like, you know, yo, this is my chance, this is my big break. And, and, and the way Christopher was selling it to us was just like, yo, you guys, we're gonna get this on television and this and that and whatever. And, and like, you know, like, this was like, yeah, okay, that's my shot. As an this artist is... wanted to be part of it. Yeah, and I think, I think, I think American Idol was already around at that time. You know, I'm not sure, but in yes. 2006. So yes, it's like, yes. it's like, you know, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you, the, the, the whole and Tempo had just come about Tempo was a um, um, because it was like the Caribbean version of MTV. So Tempo had just come out. So I think a lot of it was like, okay, these artists, everybody was thinking, oh, we can get on. We can on, get, yeah. On Tempo. Yeah. Yes. I, it was I'm not just sure. around that time. But yeah, not, around, not that time. around that time. I'm not around, around that time. It was around yeah. that time, yes. But, like, but you had like all, all of these, it was just like this this perfect time. This, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, and like you mentioned, it, it was a sort of renaissance period for, for the arts in mm -hmm. St. Lucia. Or rather for, for music, I should say, mm -hmm. not the arts, but, but for music. For music, for music. Music, for sure. And so, like I said, that was the first time I saw you. And I remember thinking at that time, my sister and I and my friend Charlene, we had a TV show. <laughs> and um, we were going to our Access second Caribbean. season. Access Caribbean, I could never Caribbean. forget that. <laughs> we were going to our second season of that TV show. And when I heard Take You I'm like, no, this has to be our intro song. <laughs> <laughs> so Esther, I think, I told her, in, um, um, either like um, interview this guy because she was working at She Magazine and tra yeah. Traveler Traveler and please ask him can we use your song can we please use your song as our intro and you said yes and we did this we did the intro and according to you it looked like a music video so you were like do you want to do a music video for, <laughs> for Take You Home <laughs> and I was like well okay yeah <laughs> and we're going to look at we're going to see Take You Home in a bit but I just have to let people know we had the first view of Jade Mountain. Before oh, Jade yeah. Mountain yes, was open, yes, yes. we had an opportunity oh, to film at Jade Mountain um, in Soufre. And so, guys, right now, here is Take You Home by Shane Ross. And we will come back to discuss it after we view. Got me thinking them really nasty things The way you look into my eyes doing them crafty things The way your hips are moving, girl I can't explain I'm feeling you the way you move, I know you feel the same I don't know if I'm dreaming, not sure if I'm awake But baby if I'm sleeping this is more than I can take let me take you home I can't leave you alone I think I want you more than anyone I've ever known Let me take you home I can't leave you alone I think I want you more than anyone I've ever known That I was your man 
the way you do them things you do you just don't understand Oh girl you're mesmerizing and you drive me wild You've got my pressure rising every time I see you smile Even though I barely know you I can't help myself You make me wanna show you things I'll show to no one else Let me take you home I can't leave you alone I think I want you more than anyone I've ever known Let me take you home I can't leave you alone I think I want you more than anyone I've ever known uh, Listen Oh yeah, I got my Tim's laced up and I'm smelling real nice Knowing the shorty been filling up on me all night She winding up on me, don't know what she's starting So I'm thinking that I'm gonna take her to my apartment So she could get to know me real well Have her leaving in the morning with a story to tell About a foot massage or an itty bitty back rub Get real close in my itty bitty bathtub You doing a dance, you winding up on it I wanna see you in just the clothes you was born with In other words, shorty, you're so cute That I wanna see you wearing just your birthday suit So that was take you home <laughs> it was like all the first for us that was like my first professional music video and uh, so what was that experience like for you um <laughs> first off let me just just backtrack just a little in terms of when when you when um when you approached me for the the theme song for access i remember one thing um you guys offered to pay me i remember yeah. that and I, I was like i was like but why should i pay you for something where it's getting me exposure because the thought process I had was like, yo, if this is, and I saw how the show was, was being promoted on, on DBS at the time. Um, I don't know, Choice? One of them. It was, it was, on, it was on, on the TV. After news, it was on, the ad for the show was on pretty much every day after news. And I was like, yo, this, that means that this song will be playing every day after news. Mm. Right, and that means that people will hear the song, and I think it's a great song, and this and that, and, that, and then everything just snowballed from there. And of course, mm. um, when 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 yourself and Esther approached me, I mean the energy that you guys had, like to me, it, it was just um, how do I put it? Like it, it just felt like everything was just coming together at the time. It's just like. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's probably like the height of the Renaissance, I would mm, say, because yeah, yeah. this 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 was another medium in terms of um, film and stuff like that. So, I mean, just it was a perfect perfect time. Let's yeah. just put it that way. Perfect and, time, and perfect happened, everything at the time. I like that. After out of, I, I will not say out of Tempest, but after Tempest and that high of all these artists, I after doing the music video, we were introduced to your. I would like to say your extended musical family, <laughs> which was Sherwin Bryce, um, um, who was the producer, um, Cherry L. Nelson Serrier. K.O. was K. part of that. Now. Yes, <laughs> K.O. was part of that. There was Ken Hardy. There was Keen Cotter Mecca. A lot of people, um, just the extended family, and that also felt like okay, there's something really big yeah, happening bubbling, yeah. in music at the time. So tell me, like, do you think it's important as a musician that you find your, I always ask people this, your tribe, your like-minded people that Absolutely. push you? Absolutely, absolutely. That, that in itself is the most important part of it. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of this statement that they, no man is an island. <clears throat> and in creative endeavors, as much as you might believe that you can do pretty much everything, you're talented, uh, talented enough to do everything yourself, you cannot, because even if you have the technical capabilities, there's always that part of it where after a while you lose your objectivity. And when in any creative endeavor, when you lose your objectivity, you begin to 
take away from that technical skill that you have. So you have to have your tribe and you have to have people that you are willing to accept their criticism, accept their judgments, accept their, mm -hmm. their comments and, and take it to heart because on your own, even if you, you might think that you have enough talent or you have enough technical capability, you do, no human being has the objectivity to be able to look at their work and say, listen, mm -hmm. I think that this person's work is better than mine. You always, you always, mm -hmm. you always have to, you have to have your tribe. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a perfect word for a tribe because it's not, mm -hmm. it's like your extended family, that's your friends, that's your confidence, that you fight with, that mm -hmm. you, that's your tribe. They understand you, they, they yeah. think along the same lines as Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But also like in the intro, I said too that you're also a producer. Yeah. What is your process like for producing, <laughs> not just a songwriting? What was that process like? Um, for me, it's music? it's a process that's longer than most, I would say, um, because of what I just mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of for a long time, I was trying to do or trying to develop the technical proficiency to be able to do everything mm -hmm. within a studio. And technically, I can do pretty much everything from. Um, composing the melody, playing the guitar, adding the samples, mixing, down to mastering. I have the technical capabilities for, to do all of that. But the, the not having the tribe was something that kind of, I wouldn't say held me back. And when I say not having the tribe, it's mm -hmm. having people that you could lean on mm -hmm. in terms of just releasing a project and say, listen, this is my part. You just take it, that's your part. For a long time, I had, I had difficulty in just mm -hmm. letting projects go. Mm -hmm. I still have difficulty in letting projects go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know that. Yeah, 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 we know I that. still have that difficulty. Mm -hmm. But, but um, my process is longer than most. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's, I have a lot of, a few confidence that, that would have heard pretty much everything that, that, mm -hmm. that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot, a lot of back and forth. Like, there's a lot of, what do you think of this now? Okay, right, that now. Right. And just to try to get that, mm -hmm. that, um, where, that where objective view. Yeah, and get, um, yeah. Yeah, so also, so then as a producer, then how do you work with other producers? Because you work with Showin, you've worked with um, Libo. These guys, they have their ideas. Um, how do how how does it work with somebody else who is a producer? Um, do you, did you just give you the beat or do you come in and say, a lot of the times, the way that it has worked for me is I viewed producers as somewhat like a translator. Okay. And through, throughout my, my career, I've, I could say that I've had a lot of different translators. Um, mm -hmm. Johan, uh, Yogi, oh, yes, the Johan, being, yes. being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Showin, as you mentioned, Libo. It's just, I know there's something that I want to say, but I don't know how to say it. And mm -hmm. so you and trust mm -hmm. these people with the... You say, I want it to sound like this, you know? But, yeah. And they can technically yeah. put it down. Absolutely. But, but for a long time, I mean, I dabbled, I noodled with, with the guitar a little bit. So I was able to translate, let's say, the, the chords or the, you know, the, the general progression. But from mm -hmm. there, I just used to just lean on, on, on them to, to take it from there. So I have a question to ask Shoot. you. Do you think some artists, I'm not saying you, some <laughs> artists suffer from <laughs> almost like <laughs> this kind of perfectionism complex? I don't think it's a complex, but like this perfectionism complex, it's supposed to be absolutely what they consider perfect. Um, I think the great ones do. Okay. The great ones do. Um, being an artist means that you, you, you're tortured if you don't do what you do. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, I could think of people like Miles Davis, mm -hmm. right? Where there's always a, I can do better, or I can do more, I can do different, I can do. The, 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 the problem with perfectionism, though, is that number one, it can never be attained. No matter what you do, you will never get something mm -hmm. that's perfect, especially where your art is concerned. Mm -hmm. And two, the greatest artworks, if the artists have to evaluate them, they'll say it's unfinished, mm -hmm. right? And um, when, you, when you consider that about art, at some point you have to learn to let it go. And you notice I'm kind of tensing up by, by saying see, that because it's like... <laughs> I can see your hands like this, but I, I totally do understand. I understand. Yeah. But then how do we excel without overpicking? How do you excel without going back and scratching it up again and saying, I can do this better and redoing it. And how, how do we manage that? How do we balance that? Excelling, making sure it is 
where it needs to be, but not overpicking. Um, <clears throat> it's. I don't think it's it's necessarily a balance that you strike. I think what it is is that. Um, if you, any artist, if you think of the volume of work of any artist, right, um, what you see is, trust me, it's just the tip of the iceberg, what you actually get, what you, what's actually released. Most times it's just the tip of the iceberg, unless they have, you know, a lot of commercial backing behind them. Mm -hmm. to, like, for example, a whole a &R team to say, you're going to do this song, that song, mm -hmm. this song, whatever. We're in the age where so many people wear so many different hats mm -hmm. that, again, what you what you hear, like the work that comes out, is probably just a, a minute volume as to what they actually have in the bag. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you speak to any producer, they'll tell you that their demo project folder is probably the biggest folder mm -hmm. on their computer, because we have a lot, a lot, a lot of demo projects. The thing is, it's being able to curate that on your own to say, you know what, I think this one is the next one. Because every piece of art that you release is, mm -hmm. is almost like a piece of yourself that you're holding up to somebody and saying, listen, mm -hmm. this is me, judge me, tell me what you think of me. Mm -hmm. And no, as an artist, when you, when you put yourself out there like that, it's a very vulnerable feeling that, mm -hmm. especially when you, when you spend a lot of time and you try to perfect it and you try to... Mm -hmm. But you know that deep down in your heart, it's not perfect. Mm. I know that if somebody looks closely enough, they'll find the flaws they'll in flaw. it. Mm -hmm. And you start to think and nitpick on that, See, and then it are becomes... They seeing it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's, it's something I've, str I've struggled with. I still struggle with it mm -hmm. to a day like today, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. But in the same vein, it, you, you, you know, you're not going to find that balance. What you, what, you, what you have to do is just hope that... Um, all you have, just change your ratios, if you will. Okay. So in other words, did a lot of these that you have as demos, take them out of the demo folder and just mm -hmm. set them free and see what they can do. Because you, you, you being the judge and the jury where your own work is concerned, mm -hmm. again, you, yes, you'll not get yes. that objectivity. So you need to just... Okay, it's I like I'm talking to myself right you, now, to yes. be honest. <laughs> right. So do you think that um, this is the mindset generally in our artist community, in the music community here, that people are striving to get excellence. Do you think that we settle? I ask that to a lot of my guests. I, Do you think we settle? It, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know the motivations of, of individual artists where their work is concerned. But what I will say is that um, by their works, you can judge them. Mm -hmm. And when I say by their works, I'm not just talking about, well, for example, having a song that, that's gone a couple of places that, that you know that it's mm -hmm. gotten you a couple of spins part of it has to do with, to do with how you maintain and <clears throat> how you sustain in your industry as well right um getting to a point where you know people think of the biggest names in the industry as yo these people make it they made they have uh, million dollar record deals and this and that whatever a lot of that is almost like winning the lottery right what a lot of people don't see is the work that goes into it and when you start to realize that it's a lot a lot of work mm -hmm. you, you kind of have to tell yourself at some point you know what am i and be honest with yourself and say, mm -hmm. am I willing to do that work and to do what it takes to get to that level? Or am I, mm -hmm. am I content in being able to be just a working musician? who? Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a balance that you have to try to strike. Mm -hmm. So for the artist community here, by your works you shall, by their works you shall judge them. Look at those who've been in the industry for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And then you'll know, okay, you're, this is somebody who has put in the work or this somebody who has put in the effort. Then you look at those who they have one song this year and then you never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. Then you'll say, you know what, this is somebody who wasn't putting in the work. This is somebody who didn't want to do what it took to actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, have some sort of longevity or some sort of noteworthy career in music. Okay. You know, and I think to be honest, a lot of artists are not honest if, with themselves, but in life, a lot of people are not honest, honest with themselves in any event. Mm -hmm. But as artists, like, you have to, you know, you, aside from the not nitpicking and not stri not looking for that perfect song before you release anything, the part of it is, you know, you have to be honest with yourself and be able to say, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough, or this is not representative of what I want to be or who I want to be. Like, I know there are artists who want to be R&B singers and what have you, and then they switch to soca. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna, if you say that you're an R&B singer and you go to soca, that's that's all well and good, but understand that you're making a switch. Mm -hmm. It's something. It's different from what you set out to do, and everybody has the right to change course. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, 
you have to be honest with yourself to be able to say, okay, I am going to stick with this particular pony, or I'm going to go with this other pony, or I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want to do, which, right. again, you have the right to do that as well. So, I have Shoot. a question. Mm -hmm. When will we get some Shane Ross music? Because um, <laughs> I know you have lots and lots of music. I have Shane. lots of music. So when are we going to get some Shane Ross music? Incidentally, before the pandemic started, or right, I think the same year, the pandemic, when mm. it was 2019, we had the, the, the first lockdown. Was it no, 2020. No, 2020. 2020. Oh, look at me, forget the whole year. March right? 2020. March yes. 19th, 2020. Yeah, 13 was our first case, I remember. Right, and by March 19th, right, we 15. had a lockdown. I guess that's where the 19 mm. kind of okay. stuff. But... I was already in the process of releasing a song every month. I had gotten to, I think, six songs. And one of the things that happened to me during the pandemic, I shouldn't say happened to me, but mm -hmm. my, and I wouldn't say hampered, I made the choice, I made the sacrifice to sacrifice the work because I had to be home with my children. So, mm -hmm. like for me, and my, my kids are, are pretty young. I mean, right now they're three and five respectively. Five and three respectively. Five <laughs> and three, what am I saying? Yeah. Whoa, five and three whoa, respectively. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at the time, mm -hmm. me being home with the kids, I, I wouldn't be able to leave the children and, you know, go to the studio mm -hmm. and try to finish this project, or, or, or and I, especially knowing how time consuming it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, my partner, when she came home, because um, mm -hmm. she was working throughout the pandemic, but when she came home, you know, she needs time to rest, and mm -hmm. there's, there's no, mm -hmm. there was no time off, really, mm -hmm. right? There was no... Um, and not just that too. It was, I think 2020 for everybody was just mentally such taxing. a men mentally yeah. taxing. I don't think anybody should should be hard on themselves for this. Yeah. Even the last two years, I don't think anybody should be hard on themselves because people say, "Oh, you were home. It's a lockdown. You should have created. You should have done something." No, I mean people have time. Need to absolutely really de-stress and try to figure out what is happening. And not just what right is happening too. And then, like for me, my. <laughs> Because for me, that means, I mean, the whole lockdown meant that I wasn't working, mm -hmm. much like a lot of, a lot right. of people. But in, in my line of work, um, I'm self-employed. Mm -hmm. So not working means that there's no, not just no guarantee of a salary or, or any sort of compensation, but there's no guarantee of work actually coming back. Mm. So for me, it was just like, okay, boy, what am I going to do? Um, I knew this was a time that I said I wanted to diversify what I was mm -hmm. doing to... <clears throat> seem to make a living, but I actually can't do anything because I have to take care of my children and this is mm -hmm. the, the major priority, that's the main priority in my life really, is my, my family. Mm -hmm. um, so it was something that for me, you know what, I was like, it's time to put it on the back burner for the time being, that particular mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. So there's still songs from that project that um, they're still there, um, mm -hmm. but part of it too is that mentioning, like I had to improve my technical proficiency in mixing. So while I was home with the kids as well, and I, was, I still wasn't going in the studio, but what I did, I started um, doing something called air training. So I signed up for like a program for air training. I signed up for uh, an online course in music and in mixing music. And then out of that whole thing, it kind of made me, I, I looked back and I was like, boy, it's probably a good thing that I didn't finish that project. Mm. Because looking back at it, the technical aspect of the music, it was, you know, I've learned so much more from right. then. You know, and that's, that's, that's one of the things that, that, that people should have taken. I mean, I understand that, you know, it, not everybody might be able to create, but mm -hmm. we should, everybody, if you consider yourself an artist with your salt, you have to take the time to sharpen your sword. Mm -hmm. And yes. sharpening your sword means even taking a mental break, really, is part of sharpening the sword. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand that your craft is still there and you have to pay attention to the craft. Even if you're not necessarily... Again, for me, even if I wasn't necessarily writing any songs or anything like that, but I was trying, I was trying to figure out the, the science behind mixing music because I knew I was like, listen, I know when this pandemic is over um, or when this lockdown is over, I still have music to release yes. and I still want to release music that is of the quality mm -hmm. of what is expected now. Talking about music, mm -hmm. let's just take a little break and listen to one of Shane's songs, um, <laughs> In Love With You. You want to tell us a little bit about that song before we go to it? Um, In Love With You was a, a song that um, 
In Love With You was, was a song that I wanted to keep simple. Kaylon Lovis is on the, on the guitars on that one. Um, there was a version that we had done previously with Jerry Joseph. Um, but uh, that one, we, again, technical proficiency, we didn't record it at a quality that was good enough. So we had to redo the entire project by the time Jerry was out. But In Love With You was my, the simplest, but I think the most mm -hmm. beautiful song that I have had written mm -hmm. up to that point. Mm -hmm. That's how many years ago? A long time, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, people like, still remember. Like 2008, maybe? Yeah, and then it's like, if somebody mentions this song, people will be like, oh, In Love With You by Shane Ross. So let's take a look at In Love With You by Shane Ross. I've been mesmerized by your pretty smile Though I haven't seen it in quite a while I've been wide awake trying to picture your face And the beauty of you I just can't escape And I have something to tell you And I hope that you feel the same And I pray That we'll be together When you hear me say When you hear me say I'm in love with you sadness away and I'm loving you more every passing day and I pray that this is forever and I hope that you feel the same and I would give anything if you believe me when I Okay, now that was In Love With You by Shane Ross. <laughs> Shane, there's something I have to bring up. Um, obviously, you've heard it. One thing we heard when you just came out, 
wow, this guy sounds like a legend. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're not trying to sound like John Legend, um, but in an industry where it's important to maintain your identity, how has that comparison affected you for the positive or for the negative? How would you think it has affected you? At, at first, to be honest, it was a little bit, to, to me, I took it in a negative light at first. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably should never have, but at the end of the day, that's all part of the, the, the growth process. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you listen to music, and there's something that I read, a term that I read that it's called unique familiarity, mm -hmm. where one of the things, that, that's pretty much one of the things that draws people to anything new. There's, there has to be something that you can identify as, oh, this sounds like that, or this, mm -hmm. you know, something that you're going to reference it to, mm -hmm. but then it has to be unique in its own right that it's mm -hmm. different. So it has to be the same but different. And as, as, as conflicting as those two ideas may seem, that's probably how I should have looked at you know, the whole comparison to John Legend because, I, I mean, he still is one of the best mm -hmm. you know, entertainers and singers and you know, all-around performers that, 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 that's still in the game today. Um, that comparison was, it was, like it was, yo, you sound really good. You sound as good as this guy. And I used to take it like, boy, so what are you trying to say? I'm trying to sound like John Legend. I'm not trying to sound like him. You know, <laughs> like, so it, it's something that I took it kind of, I took it the wrong way at first, but it's, it's, it's a compliment more than mm -hmm. anything else. So how do you think one in a business like this, how does one preserve the identity? How do you preserve your identity? You just have to do you. And I, I think that, that goes with, with anything, social media, whatever it is. Like, you just have to be genuine you. Mm -hmm. Like, present yourself. Because if you're presenting yourself, then you, you're not working. You're not trying to project any image. You're just mm -hmm. being yourself. And being yourself is, it should be the easiest thing that anybody, mm -hmm. anybody okay. has to do. Just be yourself. So do you think, okay, so see, Lucia, do you think I should say, do you think our artists have a moral obligation, do you think, mm -hmm. to create something that sounds authentically St. Lucian, um, even if it's music, fashion, film, whatever, do you think you have a moral obligation to create something uniquely St. Lucian mm -hmm. or just uniquely you? And I know obviously the two will not be different, but then what somebody considers to be, like somebody might say, okay, R&B is not um, St. Lucian. St. Lucian, or rap is not St. Lucian. Um, but what do you think? Um, to to answer that, I, 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 that, that's something I've con contemplated myself a lot. And I mm -hmm. found the answer when I was watching, I think on Netflix, I think the evolution of hip hop. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, no artist has a, mobil, a moral obligation to do anything. Mm -hmm. What happens is that Again, going back to that same unique familiarity thing that, that we spoke of, when you offer your people, or where, be it whatever region that you're from, when you offer them something that they can identify with, mm -hmm. they will ride with you. Mm -hmm. They will accept you. They will be like, yes, this is us. Mm -hmm. So as an artist, you don't, have a, you don't owe anybody the moral obligation. You don't owe anybody any responsibility to create anything that, that is complimentary or mm -hmm. derogatory to anybody. You just do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. What will happen is that based on what you want to do, if you have an audience that's big enough to carry what you want to do, mm -hmm. then they'll recognize the St. Lucian-ness or mm -hmm. the Trini-ness or you know, in whatever it is that you do. Right. If it's good, no matter what you do, it must do what it has to do. Mm -hmm. The people, the support that you get will be based on whether or not your art can relate to the community that, that you're from. Because we as artists, as much as we don't have a moral obligation to anything or anybody, but if you want to be successful as an artist, then you have to create work that is relevant to your time and your surroundings and your... Because mm -hmm. if you don't do that, then nobody will ever get you. And you'll have a lot of work, but it's very good. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get some more Shane Ross, before we switch gears a little, we're going to get some more. Um, this is Chebe <laughs> <laughs> that Shane wrote for my movie. <laughs> I like have to give myself a plug. <laughs> I hit my leg too hard. <laughs> so Chebe, you want to give us a little bit of background on Chebe? It was produced by Johan, yes. um, Johan de Tilville, Yogi. Yeah. Um, it was for my movie, The Coming of Og. It was starring Jason C. Flea and you did the theme song. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that um, song. 
Well, I remember you you approached me, you were like, um, have you considered doing a, a Quayle song with this and that? And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And then you <laughs> told me about the idea for the movie, and I was like, okay, I can, I can definitely work around something like that. And, um, you know, the... the I, from there, like, I just picked up the guitar and the chord just came to me and I was like, okay, this is okay. And mm -hmm. if I, this song, I didn't expect it. I mean, I love the song. I like the energy of the song and everything like that. But I didn't expect it to be one of these songs where, you know, people actually go, oh, my God, I, I, I absolutely love that song. Because it didn't, for me, I never really expected people to get it. Because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's Quayle, but it's different Quayle. There's nothing, I've never heard anything like that in Quayle before. Again, I didn't expect people to get it, but mm -hmm. so many people have mm -hmm. told me how much they love that song, like, mm -hmm. oh, that's their favorite song, or that they mm -hmm. prefer that song to oh, In Love right. With You. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and like, as you talk about uniquely St. Lucia, like, even yeah. if, even if um, it wasn't the intention to say I'm making a Lucian song or whatever, it just mm -hmm. comes through. So let's just take a look at Chebe by Shade Ross. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, this was Chebe by Shane Ross. So Shane, like, like I said, we're gonna switch gears a little. This show is a lot about balance. Balance in the family. Some people have nine to fives and so on. Mm -hmm. You, full-time musician, full-time dad, full-time partner. What has that like, how, sorry, what has that been like for you in terms of balancing? Do you feel like one, even pre-pandemic, during pandemic, what's that been like for you, the balance of family and music? Um, I've been fortunate for one to have, um, I have a very understanding partner, um, mm -hmm. one. 
to, for me, my, um, it's never had to, it's never, I've, I've never found myself in a position where I had to make a choice between art and, and family because my, my work essentially is my art. Mm -hmm. So for example, it's not, for some artists, their endeavor is like, okay, I'm gonna go in the shed and make that, mm -hmm. um, but my nine to five is doing something entirely different for me. My nine to five has never really been a nine to five, but it's the hours have always been condensed. Um, so I've never had to make that choice. Like I've always had enough time to be at home mm -hmm. and to be working on other parts of the craft. But the craft essentially has always been my work. No matter what, mm -hmm. what I've done, be it television, be it radio, whatever, everything has to do with music in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, even what I do now, um, well, when I get back to doing it, mm -hmm. even what I do now, I am I, I perform at, at hotels. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's doing music. It's the, I'm perfecting the performance element. Doing the radio was learning to listen to music critically and understand how music has that appeal in terms of mass reach or, or mass communication. Doing television was being able to connect with an audience, mm -hmm. you know, one on one. Like everything has to do with some facet of music or the other. Mm -hmm. So it's it's. Because of that, I've never had to find that balance because it has always been that, well, not that I never had to find that balance, mm -hmm. but that balance for me was... You feel like it was a natural balance? Yeah, it was a natural balance. It's like, so this is what I do to earn an, earn an income. Mm -hmm. This is what I have to keep doing. I can't, you know, I, I wouldn't sacrifice family for it because mm -hmm. fortunately, again, the time, the time is convinced. Mm -hmm. I'm condensed, sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like I have six, seven hours at home with the children right. during, you know, daytime kind of thing and like that. Work at and night. then work at night and... Mm, right. Yeah, and it's like, for me, that, that balance has, although I should, you know what, what I should say too, that though took a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to sharpen the sword for a long time and, mm -hmm. you know, do these, go through these various processes mm -hmm. where I could get to a point where I could say, well, I could try to work from home now. I could mm -hmm. do, or I get to you know, do stuff at the hotel. Like you have to get to a point in your craft mm -hmm. where you're good enough mm -hmm. or that you're successful enough that it becomes easy to balance. And the only way to do that is mm -hmm. to just try to find your balance mm -hmm. and be aware that there is such a thing as finding balance. And if you're aware that there's that thing, then I think if you want to keep doing what you love to do, Mm -hmm. then you will endeavor to find that balance. And also, I think it's important to have a good support system too. Absolutely. Because you mentioned your partner, because mm -hmm. I think if you don't have that kind of person in your life too, it might not be, be as easy. So yeah. very recently, Shane, um, you had what we would call a near-death experience. Uh. Um, you were in a serious car accident. Yeah. And um, it left you immobile for a while. Um, but what kind of toll did that take on you mentally? How did it affect your family, the recovery process, even at that moment, like? Um, wow, I never expected that to actually. Mm -hmm. um, this, this has been one of the most um, painful experiences of my life in terms of physical pain, that's, mm -hmm. that's for sure. I mean. But in all of that, I will say this, that the experience is one that has, I wouldn't give up that experience because of the lessons that it taught me. Mm. And um, the lessons that it taught me was like, for example, you have to learn to appreciate life and appreciate love and be able to accept love and be able to accept that there are people who will genuinely care about you and then, you know, there people are not doing things for you, or people are not offering themselves, or, or are offering themselves to you as friends or as, as, as family or, or whatever. They're not doing that just, just for the sake of doing it or just because of pity or just because, or you have to be able to accept that people do things sometimes because they genuinely love you and that you're actually good enough to be loved that people do things. I think a lot of people don't learn the lesson in life that a lot of us were not taught how to love ourselves. Mm. And part of loving yourself is being able to identify and accept love. Mm. So for example, when you mentioned a while ago about the, the balance and finding a partner, like you have to be able to identify love for you to find that kind of partner, for example, mm -hmm. right? You have to be able to, to know how to love yourself and learning to love yourself 
again, it's being able to identify love in people. So it's like, it's almost like this thing that's supposed to, f it's like the hand that draws itself. You don't, you don't really know where it starts. But what this whole accident, I mean, what, what it taught me was that you could lose everything like that. So as long as you know that you could lose everything like that, then you owe it to yourself to accept as much love as you can get mm -hmm. and to give as much love as you can give. Because if you don't do that, then what's the point of, mm -hmm. of anything? So do you feel like you've been really changed yeah. by this experience? Absolutely. This, I've never, it's, it's one of the most difficult lessons that I've had to learn, but it was a humbling experience. It was one where um, I didn't know how strong I actually was as a person. I didn't know what I could have endured through. You know, I never thought of myself as a strong person or as somebody who is, you know, like, you know, like, these sorts of things are kind of like, you expect them to be like, yo, I was in an accident, or macho mm -hmm. kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, I never, I never understood that sometimes you just have to go through things to realize that you are strong, you are, you know, you are worthy, you are, you can do, you can be what you want to be, you can survive anything. Mm -hmm. And in that time period of reflection and all of that, were you able to think about music? At that point? Music was my therapy. Mm. Music, let me tell you, I can give you an, uh, uh, I was at the hospital and um, in the accident I suffered a, a concussion as well. Mm. Well, a small minor concussion, but like serious blow to the head. But mm. for weeks afterwards, I felt like this popping sort of feeling in my head like that, like something was heavy on my face. Mm. And um, one night, I just heard this ringing sound in my oh, ear, so. mm. and um, it was like it, this. It was this like low frequency hum, like this kind of thing. Mm. And I'd just gotten my headphones brought to me at the hospital, mm -hmm. and I'm listening to, trying to listen to music, and like this hum is there, and it's mm. the music. Like I hated it, is because mm. when you took this hum, basically was blocking out everything at a certain low frequency, mm. right? And when you lose that, it's like. I'm like, jeez, I'm like... So in your head, that was yes. the hum? No, it did, yeah, because it was, it was a condition called tinnitus, oh. right? And that, I mean, that after effects of the accident and stuff like that. And um, the, either the accident or, or, or the surgery, or, or but after effects of something. And I thought that, I was like, yo, don't tell me I'm going to lose my hearing. Because mm. if I lose my... Because my voice didn't even sound as it was supposed to have sounded, because the whole bass in my voice was gone. So I'm talking, it sounds like I'm talking in a cup. Everything I'm hearing was like it's in a cup. Um, listening to everything sounds like it's in some sort of cup. I was like, wow, I'm like, that means I can't mix music. I can't listen to music. Is this permanent? Please tell me it's not permanent. So I'm like Googling the whole night and my, mm -hmm. you know, going nuts. Cause I, but fortunately, that only lasted for about like two days, two, three days. And then that was gone because mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I didn't panic right away. It was about after like the, a, a whole day of it. I was like, okay, this is not going away. This is mm -hmm. scaring me a little bit. Um, so that <laughs> that um, like experiences like that, they 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 they, they change you, man. They they mm -hmm. do something to mm -hmm. you. So do you think the the message in your music? would change, do you think, your Absolutely. approach to creation Absolutely. change? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in what way? Um, one of the things that, that I took the time to do during this period, or I would do what I would consider this other downtime, mm -hmm. was to try to, you know, I, I, was, I was doing a lot of music theory in terms of um, guitar. I mean, I've, I always played the guitar, but just noodling and just for comp the sake of composition, just, you know, let me come up with a song, blah, blah, blah. But now it's, it's more purposeful when I, when I do it. So I find myself like practicing, I have the time now, so I practice a couple of hours a day now, mm. and I'm seeing the improvements, and it's like, okay, this might be mm -hmm. the next version of, of, of my music. And because of that experience too, like the, the message now, because like, I found myself writing a song recently, and the message 
it's different. I mean, normally what I found it easy to write about was just writing about, you know, you write about the, the more primal instincts, mm -hmm. like naked, naked, take you home, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and for me, that, that, that wasn't challenging myself enough, I think, because I'd gotten to a point where I was good. I was pretty decent at it. And, mm -hmm. and I still have a lot of songs that are geared towards that, which mm -hmm. kind of puts me in a dilemma right now. I'm like, okay, should I go ahead and release that? Especially considering that now, the message that I have so far has been different. It's more of a, you know, uplifting, you know, develop yourself sort of mm -hmm. perspective, I would say, or love yourself, I should say, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and love, love, love yourself and accept that sometimes there are things that you're not in control of, mm -hmm. you know. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you think, in terms of music, they talk about improvements, do you think there's how can music on Ireland generally improve? Do you think there is something that artists need to do to help improve the sound generally, or signature music, or do you think we are there? Um, when you, wow, that's a difficult one to answer because there are so many different ways that you have to look at it. It's, it's not a problem that's, uh, and it is a problem, I would say. It's, it's, it's a multi-dimensional problem. You have the technical capabilities, which now, it's a lot cheaper and easier to, to produce a good song and to mix a good song and to have a good song, to have a song that is of, quali of the quality that can match anything that you hear globally. It's a lot cheaper to do that now, so now there's no excuse not to do it. But the thing is, what, I, what I'm finding right now is that, um, to me, the volume that I'm seeing the volume of music that I'm seeing is not, it's not as much as it could have been, as, as, as much as I expected it to, to have been given the trajectory that, that, that we were going. Like, to me, there was this one point, it felt like another renaissance was coming back prior to... Uh, to um, but maybe some people have been over-perfectionist, like, like Shane Rose. Probably. Holding back on the music. Probably. So there's Shane, probably you, not, you, you <laughs> decrease not our volume. There's probably... <laughs> no, but, there's, but you see, again, in my, in my case, like, mm. uh, there's a technical aspect to it. There is. <laughs> 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 no, that there, there is because mm -hmm. again, I took the time to develop the craft in terms of the yes. mixing side of it. Yes. And when you when you when you develop that craft, then you start to realize, okay, some of the stuff that I had mm -hmm. before, right? You no, see, this is not good. Improved. So I'm not going back on stuff that that I I, I, I have released already. But I'm right. basically going back on stuff that I was planning to release. I'm like, okay, okay, this can be better. This can be better from a technical standpoint. Okay. You know, and and that's the. One can, I mean, and even that's a slippery slope too, because sometimes you can, you can start off by saying, okay, from a technical standpoint, it's not as good, mm -hmm. but can I write it better? <laughs> oh can my I, God, yeah. there we go. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, <laughs> you're right. No, but, mm -hmm. but the industry in general, what I'm finding is that right now, it's so difficult to hold people's attention. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I feel kind of like not- the Insta snap. Yeah, man, and I feel not sorry, but, you see, for somebody coming up now as an artist, the things that you have to do to remain relevant and the amount of work that you have to put in in terms of social media management and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. it's like it's, it's a scary time mm -hmm. because you have to compete with so many... I mean, if you look at music right now, just on an international scale, a song that you love that we're raving about last week, by next week, it's, it's you finish that song already, it's like onto the next one. People's attention yeah. spans are so short nowadays that I think it's necessary as an artist to learn not to try to cater to people's needs, mm. but to try to cater to what you want to express mm -hmm. yourself. And you, hopefully you'll find your audience in that. But right now, you just have to understand that you might not find an audience in that, mm -hmm. but the, that doesn't negate the fact that you're an artist, mm -hmm. right? What you have to do is to do it because you love to do it, because any artist will tell you, you have to you do it because there's a need for you to do it, like you yes. love to do it. And as long as you do what you love to do, you, you'll find your, you might find your tribe, you may not find your tribe. You might find a big tribe, you might mm -hmm. find a small tribe, mm -hmm. but you just have to do it because you love to do it and don't expect anything. Mm -hmm. And then things will start to happen, do it, do it, because you know, not for a paycheck, not not because you know you want to like have this. So this something you have to express. Yeah, you don't have to have this 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 ideology of like, boy, I have to be famous or I want to change the world. No, if you do it because you love to do it, if you love to Everything do it enough, the world will, will change. Right, like, right. You know. So question, like you worked in radio, you worked in TV, mm -hmm. um, and we're going back on the whole moral obligation talk again. Do you think radio programmers, TV producers? have a moral obligation to play more St. Lucian music, to show more St. Lucian art 
design put more solutions faces out there um do you think that is they have a moral obligation or let just wait for the cream to rise to the top and they'll take what people are going after and play i <sighs> I, and I hope my, my, my views aren't, aren't considered controversial, but at the end of the day, I have to speak my truth. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have a moral obligation to do that. However, however, mm -hmm. they, they should have the, um, the, how would I put it, the, a patriotic obligation to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, for, I, one, one of the things that I did for, um, I was a music administrator for a period of time. And when mm -hmm. I say music administrator, I worked as a director on the board of ECHO, mm -hmm. and um, eventually the chairman for a short period of time. That's a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> um, but what, what, I, what, I, what I was able to, to, to learn at that point in time was that the issues that we face in terms of the industry here, mm -hmm. it's a global phenomenon. Yeah. You go throughout Europe and the artists will tell you that Guess what? They're not playing our music. Yeah. They're only playing American music, and a large part of what is coming back to us is not, um, or not what's coming back to us, sorry, a large part of what is played in terms of copyright revenue, that has to go to the U.S., Yes. right? Because you have, again, the Rihanna's and the this and the that. They get way, way, way more airplay than we do. The thing about it is that we, everybody is to blame where that's concerned. Because if we didn't consume so much of the foreign music, mm -hmm. then the radio, the, the radio DJ wouldn't have this, mm -hmm. you know, the, he wouldn't be worried about playing anything that he considers to be, this is what the people want. If the people let him know that this is what we want, and when I say the way they let him know, you, we have to we we have to be our own mm -hmm. tastemakers. Mm -hmm. I guess it's like it's it's, it's like sort of a balance because. There are some people I might not know about until I had played somewhere. That's true. You know what now, I mean? Remember That's earlier somewhere, I mentioned... Somewhere, right? Because like, there are different forums, like, where people are brought together. Like, we mentioned Tempest, there was the playlist and so on, where you see new talent that you didn't know about. And that, that's why I said I, I feel sorry for the artists who have to come up and do the work now. Mm -hmm. Because... Right now, there's such a large volume of it in terms of the online stuff, mm -hmm. right? People don't release in the traditional sense anymore. Right. And not just that, too, there's like, there's, there's everybody, attention spans are short. Mm -hmm. you, you can get music on demand right now on your phone. You can just pick up your phone right now and mm -hmm. listen to any song from anywhere. So to compete with that as an artist, mm -hmm. you have to... I don't know what you have to do, but you have to find a way to get people's attention yeah. somehow, if that's what you want, which is why, again, that's why I tell you, as an artist, you just have to, mm -hmm. you do it because you love to do it. Don't expect likes and don't expect it to go far and don't expect anything, but do it just they because just, you love they it. They put it to be places where you, they can be found because I get my local music from Apple Music. Imagine that. Mm. That's where I get my local music from. Um, I just think... They have to be where people can hear them, and maybe not everybody has Apple Music. I don't even have Apple Music, to be honest. I don't know how to put Apple Music. Or you on. can, or, or, or if you have Spotify or somewhere, you can you can go on. I don't have Spotify. But the, art <laughs> but the artists get how to put themselves out there. But to me, if certain people are in, that's just my view, a position to push it along, then they yeah, should. It's it's a difficult for me again. I don't right. I don't know how to navigate the industry now. Mm -hmm. um, like I can, I can tell you. Like I've just been so comfortable being just a working musician, mm -hmm. right? Just doing it for the love of it. Mm -hmm. That I don't even give that much thought to. Okay, well, let me see how I can get it trending, and let me mm -hmm. see how I can do this and do that, whatever. Like for me, it's like I do it, I drop it. You like it, you like it. You don't like right. it, you don't like it. Right. Like I'm just. I am content in just being able to do it. Yeah, that's a good place to be. Yeah, to be because, content. I mean, do you remember a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, how mm -hmm. what the landscape was like? To, yeah. be, to be honest, I came up and I had it easy. There were not, right. there were not many people doing what I did. I would say it would be easy, it would be different, because, for example, your, your goal, let's say releasing a song, releasing a music video, I can talk about that part, mm -hmm. would be I needed to be on BT. Um, tempo, HTSD, bass, mm -hmm. whatever. That was your, and once you know your music video reached there, you know I, I have that's the it. That I have, yeah. YouTube wasn't a big thing back yeah. then. Right now, mm. people just can just release like that. Yeah. So it wasn't easier 
it was just different. So now there were less people, but it was Actually, difficult. you're right. Come to think right? of it, it might have been more difficult back yes. then because and it was more expensive to do back exactly. then too. Exactly. So it was more yeah. difficult, but there were about. less people. The market was less crowded. Yes, it was difficult. So I guess it's just different. That's, but you know what? That's that 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 in itself is balance right there, mm -hmm. because like you said, there were less people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the but as much as there were less people doing it, process. it was the process was long and it was more expensive to do. Mm -hmm. So it basically that was part of the reason that there were le less yes, people exactly. in any event. Yeah, even to produce to produce music, the music equipment um, was more expensive. The Camera equipment was bigger and more expensive. To edit was more expensive. Everything was more expensive, more cumbersome, more work. But I think that was a good thing too because you put more effort into what you're doing. Mm. Right now, it's easier to make a I song. I see what you're saying. It's easier to make a video. I can just pick up my phone and make a music video. So the time I would take before to say this shot, that shot, that shot, that's out the window for some people. The same thing with music. You're absolutely right. And you know what? I I never, in mm -hmm. all my, my, my mm -hmm. ponderings about it, I never had that, that particular perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and you're absolutely right because, yeah, because people, like, it's like, they seem, because of the, the ease of doing it, there mm -hmm. seems to be a Less lack of appreciation yeah, some, for some people. Some people, yeah. There are some people who take it very seriously. Um, and some people were able, who had the mindset back then to be able to move with the time and to adapt. Mm. Um, but not some people just came up in this era of snap and insta. Yeah, so yeah. it's short, like you said, um, short attention span and all of that. It's just different times. You know, you know what, what I, I related to as well? Like there's this thing where there's, um, for me, I, I experience that a lot too. There's something called paralysis of choice. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's so many different options right now in terms of even as a creator, mm -hmm. like if you know the inner working workings of let's say masking when it comes to Photoshop and, right. and stuff like that, like you know the the possibilities, you know how. Right now, it's it's because everything is so automated. Like they can just click, mm -hmm. and you have that entire process but there. You know the reason for the process. Right, the, but the process. some people don't know the reason for the process, yes. but they just do it. And yes. when they do it like that, then it, there's this ad hoc and haphazard sort of yes. look to it. But when you know the process, then you're mm -hmm. able to yes. say, okay, well, this is that. But that still puts you in, in, in a similar position where, mm -hmm. so you know that, 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 you still have paralysis of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and True. then a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of, like they, it's it, it, it yeah. it's yeah because it's automated. They don't want to. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to take the time to invest in understanding I, I the process. I don't think like they don't want to take the time, but that's all they've known. True. So it's not like they don't take the time. That's all they know. They just know that's how you do it. I pick up my phone and I do it. Mm. They don't know what the process was like from before. Because if I have to take from my own experience, splicing film yeah. when I learned how to, <laughs> to go, when I went to film school. I shot on a film camera, I had to look at the film, splice it together and stick it. Now you just have something that's um, yeah, non-linear, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So what advice would you have for somebody who's like just entering into this entertainment, music entertainment? Sharpen your sword and do what you <laughs> love to do. Get, get, if you're doing something, don't just do it for the sake of, well, I want to be famous or I want to do whatever. No. If your aim is to make a living off of doing it, treat it like it's a profession. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to understand that what you expected that profession to be starting off might not be what it really is. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm a working musician right now, and that's something that I've, I've done for all of my life, despite everything else that I've done. I've been a working musician. If it's mm -hmm. not for the hotel, it's... Mm -hmm. It's wherever on this stage show, like hosting shows all over the place and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. When you, when you understand, like for me, I knew my market. I knew that Saint Lucia is if I can make a living doing this, and I know how to make a living doing this, then I'm going to do this mm -hmm. in that particular way. Now, what I did, I didn't just go and do stuff off of my head. I trained myself in various mm -hmm. fields where these things were concerned. So in that. My advice to any young person coming up, sharpen your sword, learn your skill, learn your skill as well as you can before you even tell somebody that I am a producer or I am whatever. Mm -hmm. Because to be honest, I, do, I still don't even consider myself to be a producer. I consider that mm -hmm. I happen to produce music, mm -hmm. but the, the, the ins and outs of being a producer, I've never gone through the rigors of up, up to the point where that, that I know some of my friends have. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't even consider myself on that level. You know, am I able to produce? Yes, but I'm not a 
producer right you know so don't call yourself what you what you are not trained to do mm -hmm. gladwell malcolm gladwell mm -hmm. 10 years or 10,000 hours right put in your 10,000 hours before you can call yourself a master and don't call yourself a master let other people call you a master of whatever mm -hmm. your craft Very, is yep 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 very good advice <laughs> so what is your ultimate goal when you get it as you'll say i have arrived there is no ultimate goal there's no okay. i have arrived aspect of it i mean for me again one of my i looked back i was able to look back and i was able to understand i think at a very young age that it's not there's like again when when you see the, the big, the huge names, that's like winning the lottery. There's a huge gray area that you can live comfortably within that gray area and not getting to that point where, you know, you, you felt like you won the lottery or, you know, like the, the mega stars, the global mm -hmm. mega stars. Mm -hmm. Not getting to that point doesn't mean that you haven't made it. No, not getting to that point doesn't mean that you cannot make a living off of doing what you love to do. I think making it is getting up every single day and doing exactly what you love to do. Because there's a saying that goes like this, if you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. So getting up and not working, I, okay. I think that's, I that's think making that's a, it. A really fantastic place to sort of start the wrap up. Um, so Shane, how can people, um, how can folks hear your music? How can they get in touch with you? Can you give us your social handles? Uh, Shane Ross Music, it's... Um, and that's Shane with a wire, you yeah, know, so Shane it's Ross music. handles right here. That's my social media. Um, mm -hmm. Um, that's it. Hit me up on there. You can message me and then we can talk business. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Shane, it was really an absolute pleasure. Um, it was a real absolute pleasure sitting down with you um, and talking about your journey and your recent accident and all of that. So hopefully very soon and maybe as we close the show, we'll close the show with some a snippet of some Shane Ross <laughs> music. You know, we'll just put that in. But he gives me a copy of his music. <laughs> I wish I had the phone. I have, a, I have a song called Deeper. Like, that's, okay. that's a dope song. Okay, so we're going to hear some Shane Ross music as the credits roll. But... <laughs> you know what? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Okay, great. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Okay, we're going to get that. Um, so I, the, my, my, my track record of giving Davino Lee my music is, is, is pretty good, so why yes, not? Yes, and I've never leaked his music. I get it. But no, I'm not talking about the leaking it. I'm talking about what I'm saying. Good things have happened oh, when I've given Davino Lee my oh, music. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> guys, this has been Creative Excellence. I really enjoyed this sit down with Shane Ross. So, catch us next time. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, this week.